Yes. Okay. Um, I'd like to open this morning with a parable about St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis of Assisi is the patron saint of animals. And when St. Francis was staying in a small village, he learned of a wolf who was terrorizing the town, eating all the wildlife as well as the people. And the villagers became afraid to leave the town walls except to hunt the wolf. When St. Francis learned of the situation, committed that God would protect him, he ventured outside the city walls to encounter and communicate with the wolf. St. Francis explained to the wolf that he was terrorizing the people and asked him to make peace. He asked that the wolf harm them no more and vowed in return that the townspeople would not harm the wolf. The wolf agreed by extending a paw and placing it in St. Francis's hand. The wolf followed St. Francis to the town where he negotiated the peace agreement. The townspeople, seeing the wolf contrite, agreed that if the wolf no longer harmed them, they would feed the wolf, and the pact was made. The wolf lived for two more years in peace among the townspeople going door to door, receiving the food they had promised. When the wolf finally passed into spirit, through old age, the townspeople were sad because he had become one of them. The wolf was a reminder of the teaching of St. Francis that patience, understanding, and the communication with animals is the true virtue of God, and that all creatures on earth, human and animal, are deserving of love, compassion, and understanding. What the wolf took with him was a lesson of love, forgiveness, and kindness. And to quote St. Francis, remember that when you leave this earth, you can take with you nothing that you have received, only what you have given. Okay, as we were told, I am an animal communicator, a Reiki master, and a psychic medium. And in my capacity as an animal communicator, speaking with animals and spirit is one of my specialties. Now, a lot of you may have had readings by, from psychic mediums. Um, there are some similarities and there are some differences. Uh, some of the similarities are, on the other side, energy is energy is energy is energy. There is no gender, there is no age, and there is no species. But when I raise my vibration and they lower their vibration and we meet halfway in the middle, they present themselves as they were in body so that the people that I'm reading for can recognize them. And that's the same for animals and people across the board. <clears throat> there are differences, however. And to give you a little background on the differences, first I want to tell you about an ancient Hawaiian philosophy called Huna. And in Huna, we consider that we have three selves, much like many philosophies, but we call them the Ku, the Lono, and the Kane, or the Aumakua. And the Ku is the subconscious, the Lono is the conscious or the logical mind, and the Aumakua, or the Kane, is the higher self or the superconscious. And I heard one person in lecture speak um, saying that animals don't have souls because they don't conceptualize God. Okay, clearly I don't believe this. <laughs> My response to this is that humans are very, very lono based. They are very much in their conscious mind. We are very much in their con our conscious minds. And in that, we spend years, a lifetime, maybe lifetimes, learning how to empty our minds, learning how to meditate, learning how to let go, learning how to connect with God. In my experience, animals are already there. 
Animals are there naturally. They are very coup based. They know how to be. They just are. I mean, you guys, I'm, I'm sure many of you have animals. You watch your animals. They just sit, and don't you ever look at them and just go, God, I wish I could just be in that body sometimes. Because they just are. They are, they are connected on, on, on a permanent level. And they are, I consider them to be on a higher spiritual plane. Now, I know that this is a controversial view. I believe that animals and humans can go back and forth between lifetimes um, in reincarnation. But I think of animals as, as being on a higher spiritual plane because they have that constant connection with source. Now another difference is that humans' lives are very, very large and very complicated. We have, we have friends, we have family, we have co-workers, we go and do this, we do that. And uh, when I talk to people on the other side, a lot of the evidence that I get, it ends up being that the evidence is a lot of the message. Now, there are certainly messages of love, and it's not that I've never gotten high spiritual messages from people, but you have to go through their ego. Since they're presenting themselves as they were in this life, we have to go through the, the human ego to get to them. Whereas animals, their lives are very, very small in in this incarnation, in their incarnations where they are. I mean, we are their entire lives, many of them. Think of your cat, you know, they live inside your house. That's their environment. We are their family. We are everything. So when I talk to animals on the other side, we there's certainly a lot of evidence and there's certainly the messages of love. But when when I'm speaking with someone, a, um, a pet mom or dad who is open to spiritual messages, the spiritual messages that I can get from animals can be incredible on, on just a, a very high grand scale. And in that, I'd like to share three stories of, for, with you of animals that I've spoken with, highlighting some of these messages. Because I, I feel really blessed to be able to learn from these animals. And now I feel blessed to be able to share them with you. First, I'm going to tell you three stories. I'm going to tell you about a cat's explanation of our soul's evolutionary journey. I'm going to tell you about a flying squirrel's description of the importance of being connected with nature. And I'm going to tell you about a horse's ancestral concern for her species. But first, I'm going to tell you about Harpo. Harpo was a little kitty, a little, cute little kitty. He was only a year and a half when he passed, very young. Yet, when I first connected with him, he immediately presented himself as a very wise soul, certainly a teacher. And when we, we got past the evidence, we got some information, some, some loving messages for his mom on a personal level, but he put his mom and I in a classroom. He became very professorial when she, when she asked about if he were coming back to her. And he said that we were on the same spiritual level, and that's why we could be in the same grade, so to speak, the same classroom. And he talked about he said that, yes, he would see her, but he didn't talk about lifetimes. He said it's not about lifetimes together. It's about shared experiences on the soul's evolutionary journey. And he said that they will have many shared experiences together. But in his words, he said, lifetimes are not the be-all, end-all. Lifetimes are not the focus. Lifetimes are not the it. 
Lifetimes are just the experience along the it. We have a greater soul evolutionary journey and our lifetimes are just these shared experiences. And he said that he was honored to be able to share that life as short as it was, um, to share that experience with her, but that he looked at it not as a lifetime, but that shared experience. He also went on to say that we humans need to start understanding that our, <laughs> that our lives are so puny. Our, that's the word he used, puny. They're very, very little. They're tiny little lives. Our lives are so little in the great scheme of things. He said it's layered. It's the experience within the experience that is important. It's the experience it's the experiences that we live in our lives, the experiences like having them, animals, in our lives that we take, and that will be the crux, the genesis of the next experience and, that, and what that experience will be when you put them all together. So he looked at it as these not just experiences in our lives, but these experiences across lifetimes. And um, he gave the example of, say you go on vacation and you meet somebody, and you have a great time with them, you go out to dinner, and, and maybe you go kayaking or whatever, and then you have that choice to either Keep that experience, that shared experience of uh, you know, in your memory banks and keep it and live with it and, and enjoy that memory. Or you can exchange phone numbers with that person and become lifetime friends. And this is how he related these shared experiences. Um, so when we when we repeat lifetimes with other souls, it's kind of like trading the phone numbers. <laughs> um, and we do that when we have strong soul contracts with other people. Now, how many of you, do you all know what soul contracts are? How many of you know what a soul contract is? Okay, so a few of you. I'll, I'll briefly explain. A soul contract <laughs> is when we are on the other side in spirit, we make agreements with other souls and other spirits on the other side, that when we come into an, in, an incarnation, into this life, that we will meet each other and we will teach each other something. Okay, that will be a soul contract. But when, and, and he was, this was the amazing part about this, he was so professorial, because when he finished talking about the shared experience, he, he and this is exactly the way he said it, he said, now, do either of you have any further questions on soul contracts or the soul's evolutionary journey? <laughs> no. No. Okay. <laughs> and so his mom had some further questions on soul contracts. And she, he, he explained that we have soul contracts with everyone. Lar they could be large, they can be small, but they're with everyone. And the example that he used was, let's say you go shopping. You have a sole contract with the person that you pay for your food. It may be a very small sole contract. It may be just pleasantries as you walk by, or it may be a big sole contract. You may say something to them that changes the way they think, even though it's a one-time thing. But he also said, we have free will to change soul contracts. And he made the example of, let's say you go in and to that same person you have a soul contract with to buy the food, but you walk out without paying for the food. You've either stolen it or you've forgotten to pay or for some other reason. And then that person goes, let's say he goes running out after you and he falls and he breaks his leg and he loses his job and he becomes homeless. Or he falls and he breaks his leg and he loses his job and he goes on to find a wonderful job. 
One way or the other, you have changed that soul contract. And Harpo talks about it as consequences. He says, every single decision we make with our free will has consequences. Every single thing, every single person, everything that we do is a soul contract. It's just a matter of level. It's just a matter of how we proceed to carry out that contract. Our free will is what we use to carry out that contract. And so he asks, uh, he asked us to recognize our experiences, no matter how small or how large, but that recognize that these contracts that we have with each other connects us all because that is, that's why those consequences exist because we are all connected by those soul contracts. Now, not only do soul contracts connect us with one another, but Boo Boo, our second story, <laughs> teaches us how animals view and connect with nature. Now, Boo Boo is a flying squirrel. And Boo Boo was eight months when he passed. And he was domesticated. His mom found him as a little baby. He fell out of a tree. And she did everything right. She, she, found, she found him. She didn't touch him. She waited two hours to see if his, his biological mom would come back. But she, she watched and, and she didn't. So she picked her up and she domesticated him. And, and <laughs> Boo Boo actually even lived in her blouse. She would, he would crawl up her sleeve and in here, and then he would crawl into her cleavage, and then he would just live in her cleavage, and she'd walk around the house and do all the things. <laughs> he became her tree, and, um, or she became his tree. Um, he, and Boo Boo, oh, he, Boo Boo was the bomb. Boo Boo was all that. He had such a dynamic personality. He, the first thing that he said to me when I talked to him, he said, we don't really fly. And he pauses and he says, but we jump really, really good. <laughs> so he had a sense of humor, he had a personality, but his message, uh, it was, I'll never forget it because he not only showed me through his eyes what it was look, what it's like to be a woodland creature, but he made me feel Feel it. Now I'm a person who's, I feel that I'm pretty connected with nature, I have a, a healthy respect with nature, but until I spoke with Boo Boo, I never really understood to the level of being at one with nature that he expressed woodland creatures to be. <clears throat> and he expressed it like this. He said, trees have souls too. The bark has a soul, the dirt has a soul, the bugs have souls, and while they can be individual, they are not really individual souls, they are collective souls, because souls are energy and there is no dividing line between energy. And he went on to talk about humans and how we are focused because of our Lono focus, because we are we are so separate, we, we pave things over and we separate ourselves from the outside world. We separate ourselves from nature. And he said, we, humans, have to survive in building houses, moving with cars that are so removed from nature because our very existence is completely removed with everything that we do. He said, humans are the only species on the planet that use up the planet to survive, whereas all other species survive with the planet. And as I said, the, the most wonderful part of this was the fact that he expressed it through emotion and the idea of him being at one with nature. And yeah, well, Boo Boo reminds us that we are part of the earth. 
Uh, Lava Lady, in our last story, is concerned about the ancestry and survival of her species. Now, Lava Lady came to a woman who owns a horse sanctuary in a dream. And she was asking for assistance. The woman who owns the horse sanctuary asked for her name in the dream, and she gave her the name Lava Lady. She then went and researched this, and she found two horses that were Lava Ladies. She found one Lava Lady who is a racehorse in Florida who is pregnant and currently for sale. She found another lava lady who was a racehorse in the early part of the 20th century, in the 1900s. And most of what I spoke with was the lava lady in spirit because she was kind of taking care of the, the one that was still alive. And racehorses have a, have, have a really difficult life, and, and she had, as she said, as, as I mentioned, she had an ancestral concern for racehorses but, and, and the equine species as a whole. But she said racehorses are a heightened example of it. Because from the outside, because they're owned, quote unquote, owned by people of means, by very wealthy people, their physical needs are met. They have nice coats, they eat, they have plenty enough to eat, they live in these beautiful stalls, they have beautiful pastures. But what we as humans don't see from the outside is that their emotional needs are not met. They may have trainers, they may have people that come in and out and take care of them, but they don't have that real emotional connection and she says that she's concerned because that's what's being lost. She said, she quotes, I quote her, I quote her, for horses as a species to survive and thrive, we need to be heard. Think of where we came from. And then she showed me a picture of horses running wild. It was beautiful. Uh, she says, basically, this doesn't exist in this space continuum anymore. It's a very dismal time for so many of us because we live in such big bodies, even those who do understand and love us. It's different than the domestic animals you have, where you sleep with your pets, you eat with your pets, you live with your pets. He says, she said, there are a few of us who are very lucky, but relatively few. She says, I fear for the species breeding as it is done, is breeding out the beauty of all of us, the beauty of our true nature, the, the wildness of our true nature. And she talks about animals becoming tools, and brood mares are one of those things. I mean, think about how people would feel if, if their babies were just taken away from them. Well, Horses are no different. Animals are no different. They don't want their babies taken away from them. But what Lava Lady says is that because it happens on the scale that it does, especially with racehorses, is that broodmares that have babies are not even starting to emotionally connect with the babies, so the babies themselves are not even learning how to have any emotional connection at all. She says, she, she says that horses are becoming emotionally void and becoming robots. And when she contacted this woman at the horse sanctuary in the, in the dream, it was a plea for the word, to get the word out to help people understand that they need to retain their ancestral nature. But the upside of this is, is that this woman who runs this sanctuary is more connected with horses than anybody I've ever met. I know she has a lot of past lives as a horse. Um, and she is fully committed to getting the word out and about the necessity of helping racehorses and the species retain their true nature from the horse's perspective. 
Because that's the important thing, not about just horses, but about animals as a whole. When I speak with animals, it's always from their perspective. And they, they really do have a unique perspective, and they use that perspective to teach us. That's why they come into our lives. We have those soul contracts with them, and they do teach us, and we are connected with them. And, they, and I'm going to reiterate St. Francis's quote, remember that when you leave this earth, you can take with you nothing that you have received, only what you have given. And nobody gives more than animals, and we are so blessed to have them in our lives. So I thank you guys for being here. I really appreciate you being here today, and thank you very much for having me.